good afternoon. Uh, what we would like, we would like to welcome you to the next generation of extension learners for leaders. Uh, we, I am not Ed Jones. Ed stated that he would come on a little later. So what we would like to do now, just move into our slide presentation. We, uh, and on our concerning our discussion this afternoon. So may I have the first slide, please? Uh, our discussion this afternoon is centered around the the uh, Excellence in Extension Award and also our National Extension Diversity Award. Uh, you see our APLU address. We're going to direct you to uh, that uh, website to get more details on the award. But first of all, I'd like for you to pay close attention to the May the 1st date. Uh, if we, you are applying for either the award, you must submit uh, your, nomine your nominee. You must submit, submit your nominee by May 1st, 5 p.m. specific, uh, specific time. Uh, just, just briefly, when we look at the, the, these awards, and I've had an opportunity over the years to, uh, to, to, to participate either in evaluating or and or congratulating individuals that have received the awards. So the following awards are offered by the Extension Committee on Organization and Policy, ECOP, in partnership with USDA uh, NIFA. And as we indicated, you see the deadline. So when you look at the, ex just briefly, when you look at the Excellent and Extension Award, we're basically looking at an award where we are recognizing, ECOP is recognizing professional development, I mean, it's the professional development uh, committee of ECOP and recognizing a select group of corporate extension professionals who exceed or excel in extension programming. And this is what we are about. Uh, 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 exceeding and, and produ producing the best extension programs possible. We want to make a positive impact on the, our constituents which we serve and provide visionary leadership for the system. Uh, this award is designed to focus on focus national attention on the role of extension, uh, one that we believe is fundamental to the, the lifelong education development of residents in the community in which we serve. The next award, which is the National Extension Diversity Award, uh, the purpose of this award, uh, it, it, the purpose of this award, it is a project of ECOP program committee. Once again, our program committee. And this award, we acknowledge accomplishments of corporate extension professionals uh, in achieving organizational change and support the diversity and so on as it relates to uh, our extension audience. The award for diversity is designed for focus to focus national attention on innovative models and techniques that ensure that extension programs are equitable, equitably engage all appropriate audience in which we serve. Uh, the next slide. Uh, the next slide just basically shows, uh, is a, uh, show an example of part of the award in which the recipient uh, receive. Uh, the, they were, the recipient will receive a uh, commemorative trophy, as you see in the slide. In addition to that, they will receive a cash award. And to, to get the recipient to APLU, these awards are usually granted during our APLU meeting in November. And the recipient also uh, has uh, travel uh, to this war paid for by ECOP. The next slide. And just uh, if I might, Dr. Lattimore, mention that it, this is in partnership with USDA NIFA. Exactly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the snap that you're about to see, and you can just continue, uh, these are individuals that have received uh, the awards, uh, and they represent uh, the universities throughout our land grant system. So we are very pleased of, uh, in, with the individuals. And also, most important, we are pleased with the work in which these individuals and other individuals throughout our land grant system contribute to, uh, to our organization, and most importantly, to the sustainability uh, of our audience. Next slide. So when we look at the Excellent in Extension Award, uh, as we stated, these are annual awards. This is an annual award. 
uh, of excellence in extension, and it's presented to individuals who have strived, as we stated earlier, through that throughout that career. Uh, and these this award these include, but are not limited to, a demonstration of high impact programs, uh, the visionary leadership and participation of emerging uh, issues as it relates to our clients and uh, as it relates to our clientele and the system. Uh, we have commitment to diversity and also we look at integration of programs in partnership with university colleagues and outside clientele. So we really covers the gamut as we uh, we uh, look at our the nominees for these for these awards so excellent and extension award well, this I, so can i this is lou can i quickly add a question mark question yes. on here so it says and um so does that mean that somebody has to be not only a triple threat but a four-way threat they've got to go from local to national uh, the the, uh, the last one was the integration of programs and partnership with university colleagues and uh, it's, the one, it's the one that says local, state, and national. That's correct. That's correct. So it has to be all all of these local, state, and national. Right. You you start you start. Uh, the nominees are usually uh, uh, selected by that region, and that region is submitted. That so submit the person to compete at the regional level, and uh, once. It's, that's not what I'm asking. Okay. I get that. What I'm asking is, does the does the person or group that we want to uh, recognize, do they have to have a clear record of being a triple threat, of being great local, great uh, state, which I think most of you know we have a lot there, but then national, that's the more tricky one. So, yeah. they, so a, a, a successful nominee has to meet excellence in all three levels of extension. Uh, Lou, uh, if you, if I may, Dr. Um, Lattimore, um, yes. this is Fonda. Uh -huh. um, it's it's local, state, regional, or national. Thank so you. It, so it can be a com it can be a combination. It could be one that's Good. really exceptional, Good. or it could be a combination of of any yeah. of any of those. Yes. Yeah. Just so it's or because I heard and and I'm but I yes. couldn't see the slide. Yes, it's 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 or. It's or. Good. Hey, thank you, thank you, Ron. Uh, Dr. Lattimore, do you want me to go ahead and finish this um, yeah. part of it? Since yes, I'm... please. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you uh, again, um, Dr. Lattimore, for getting started with that. Um, like you mentioned, the annual award, um, it, we have an annual award, but there is a, 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 a two-layer process. We have the regional awards as well as the, um, the national and uh, the criteria that we look at for excellence in, in extension educational programming. Um, include this demonstration of high impact programs and um, like Lou wanted us to make sure that we clarified uh, whether it be local at the local level the state the regional or national level or or if the program has a combination of those those um, those responsibilities we'd like to see that these programs um, uh, exhibit visionary leadership as well as anticipation of emerging issues for clientele as well as the system uh, we would like, you know, definitely would want to see a commitment to diversity, as well as integrating programs in partnership with those on our individual campuses, as well as outside clientele and other stakeholders. Can we go to the next slide? Yeah. Um, nominees, uh, like we said, should be recognized as leaders in, at his or her university. Um, the communities that they serve, as well as in the respective field of expertise. Um, we know that resources are very important um, and they should demonstrate the ability to garner a continual flow of resources to sustain programs, uh, as well as using innovative teaching methods. When we think of excellence for an extension professional, we want those persons or those programs to exhibit uh, sustained and meritorious programming. And of course, we want to see at least five consecutive years of work experience in extension. Next slide, please. Uh, to be eligible um, for um, any of the Excellence in Extension Awards, the nominee must be an active cooperative extension professional here at the state level, maybe a state specialist, 
uh, a regional or, or even a county-based um, county based faculty member. They need to have at least 50%, uh, a 50% appointment in extension. Um, administrative FTE in this areas are not, um, do not qualify. Uh, the nominee, like I said before, must have responsibility in extension for a minimum of five consecutive years. And these nominees can be submitted by the nominee themselves, a supervisor, or even a peer. Um, these nominees also need to include an endorsement by the institutional, the extension director or administrator or whoever they designate, designate for, that, for that purpose. Next slide, please. Our nomination and review process um, is pretty straightforward. Um, it's an, an online um, submission process. And like I mentioned, it's um, sort of a two-step. We have, um, the, of the five regions, each you get nominees. Faculty will either nominate themselves or there will be nominations from each of the five regions, the 1890 region, uh, Northeast, North Central, Southern, and Western region. And those nominations uh, are reviewed by committees within the region and to take, for example, in the 1890 region, we will have four uh, regional winners for each one of the program, program, um, program areas, but the overall person with the overall program with the highest score is, what's, is who is, is, is goes on for the national uh, competition. Um, those committees uh, recommend um, that nomination to the ECOP Professional Development Committee and the Professional Development Committee reviews those recommendations and make the selection for the national award, which um, uh, like Dr. Lattimore said earlier, is awarded at APOU. Um, I wanna reiterate also the deadline being May 1st of, of every year. And we are really, really excited about the uh, crop of, of submissions for this year. Um, all of the years that I've been involved, they have really been some, some really, really, um, impactful programs and um, they seem to get better and better each year. So we are really, really looking forward to, um, to that, um, to the next round. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, that's it. I just saw the information I have for the Excellence and Extension Award. And if there aren't any questions, I can turn it over to uh, Carolyn Williams to share information about the Extension Diversity Award. Thank you, Vonda. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Carolyn Williams and I chair the ECOP committee, uh, program committee. And uh, while the Excellence and Extension Award focuses on individuals, the National Extension Diversity Award focuses on programs. And with Sandy's amazing help, it's handled by the ECOP program committee. Uh, this award uh, recognizes extension efforts that support the creation of a a diverse and pluralistic cooperative extension organization at the local, regional, and state and national levels. Through this award, we lift up high quality programs that demonstrate commitment to and accommodation for people without regard to age, class, gender, physical and mental abilities, sex, race and sexual orientation, spiritual practices, and other human differences. Uh, nominees can be individuals or a team or an organization uh, fundamentally composed of cooperative extension professionals. Next slide. Okay. Um, such programmatic efforts uh, could impact one or more of the following areas. Uh, the audience, uh, administration, funding, coalitions, programs, policies, staff advisor, et cetera, as well as educational uh, materials and delivery methods. Now, the recipients of the award for diversity, as has been mentioned, are recognized at APLU with a really nice trophy and a really, really nice cash award from ECOP. In addition to this, um, the individuals and their institutions are publicized in the National Impact Database by APLU, ECOP Stories, and through local, state, and national media. Uh, next slide. 
the re there are six uh, elements that are considered in the review process and the review board is composed of the members of the ECOP program committee. Uh, the first uh, element is purpose. Uh, why was this effort undertaken? The nomination clearly describes the efforts by a person, group, or an organization to achieve diversity or pluralism in extension organizations, programs, and our audiences. And of course, you see this a maximum of 10 points for this area. The next is the basis. Why is this effort worthy of recognition? Uh, the nomination clearly delineates reasons why the nominated person or group deserves recognition. Uh, the third one is the effort or actions and activities in support of diversity appropriate and educationally sound. Actions and activities in support of diversity are appropriate uh, and demonstrate impact. And uh, the, the points go up to 20%. Uh, the positive impact um, have efforts led to positive sustainable change. Uh, evidence uh, exists to that efforts have led to positive programmatic and or organizational change. And then we have the scope. How broadly or how likely will this effort affect the cooperative extension system? Uh, evidence exists that the scope of the impact is broad with observable national impact or the potential for system-wide benefit. Um, the last one is innovation. How did or how will this effort create new models for positive change? Uh, the effort is, is innovative in its application, method, or, or approach in such a way that has led to new ways of positive organizational change. We usually have 10 to 20 nominations each year. Uh, even though we're not ready for the extra workload, we would really like to see at least one application from every institution because we know that the quality of work is there. Uh, you may see this as an extreme, but we would ask that all of you would submit people who demonstrate this professional commitment to serving all people who can benefit from our extension programs. Uh, we should all be recognizing our colleagues for doing these great practices and submitting the information to the national level is just another step of doing this. And if no other questions, we will go to the next presenter. This is Ed, and uh, thank you very much, Carolyn and Vonda and, and Mark for getting us kicked off. I appreciate that, and, and we're gonna hold questions until after our next presenters, but. Um, I think you heard the challenge from Carolyn that everybody, they want to work hard. So we want to make sure they all get an opportunity to, to review a nomination from all our institutions. So thank you very much. Now we're going to move into a case study. And many of you know Suzanne Dethridge and, uh, from Texas A&M. She's retired but still active. And Ann Kellert. And they're going to walk us through a case study of, of how to look at this and make winning proposals. So Suzanne and Ann. Yeah. Well, well, thank you, Ed. We're really glad to be here because we have received that question so often, you know, how do I write a better nomination? And in fact, that question gave rise to including us, I think, in today's session and bringing me out of retirement. So this is fun. Um, and Ann is going to, to uh, speak. She's still very active working with folks uh, and she's going to speak to actual writing and writing skills and strategies. Uh, but I will reflect uh, for a little bit on the challenge that I see that so often the nominator and the nominee are writing in isolation with very little organizational support, particularly beyond the, the unit or department level. So I'll uh, speak first about some of the organizational aspects at the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service as far as a, a case study that um, led to, uh, it evolved 
uh, from the early 2000s over the administrations of three directors and led to the success of our nominees in winning uh, six regional and three national awards over a period of eight years. Uh, so hopefully this case study will uh, allow you to look at the organizational aspects in your state uh, and apply a systems thinking approach to make the most and improve your efforts, your rewards management. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as far as organizational uh, support, and this was a trend nationwide in the early 2000s to see program development and evaluation being redirected to focus on outcomes versus outputs. And that uh, really goes to the quality of the source material, what you're reporting. Um, also in Texas, we appointed an economist to analyze economic impacts of extension programs to work across the organization, across uh, departments and disciplines to begin analyzing the actual economic impacts. And that continues to this day. And all of those reports are available online. If you'd like to see them, the URL is included there. And I served uh, at the office of the director and my responsibilities were broadened to include management of our agency awards and supporting and collaborating with nominees uh, who were uplifted to uh, submit for higher level external awards. Uh, and internally, we did make sure that we looked at, across our awards criteria and uh, ensured that they cited and rewarded outcome-based programming. So the whole point of this, uh, as we move to the next slide on awards management, you can do it differently. It's done differently in many places, but to make sure internally uh, at your lowest level that you are um, improving through economic impact analysis and outcome-based programming, improving your source material, your documentation that will be referenced as you write nominations and proposals. Uh, the awards management at the institution level. These are some steps that we followed. And of course, they can vary from place to place. Uh, the whole point is to improve the pipeline, grow the base of your uh, institutional or agency level nominations. Uh, we would receive anywhere from 90 to 100 plus every year on our annual awards program and uh, be involved in giving counsel to the departments, giving tips to the department, critiques after the awards program, um, anything to increase the number of nominations, the quality of the nominations, and uh, the representativeness. Uh, very important uh, in helping you see a, a sample solicitation a statement that we provided in the guidelines to improve the odds that the testimonies coming back would, would address the points that we needed. Um, this at the, let's see, I think it's the next slide. Shows how really this was the most democratic, you know, very involved in using peer review committees and very rarely did our administration reverse the recommendations, uh, uh, make a, a tweak based on some personnel flag or something so rare. Uh, this was purely peer driven, uh, but we did give oversight to track the nominations and make sure that you know they were coming from all of the organization and that you just didn't have a mill that said negatively sometimes about some departments, you know, just have that mill and they're very successful, but we want everyone to have that mill, you know, and to do uh, effective, be geared to writing effective nominations. Uh, next slide. And I think this is where you would see the most impact on your success going to higher level, regional and national level awards. Uh, we felt that there is so much effort that the staff and faculty spend on nominations development. And, and frankly, too much imposition on our supporters and our clientele to write testimonies. 
and that we as an organization have a level of recognition to know which uh, efforts might be most competitive. So we took an approach of both accepting, issuing a call to, for nominations and accepting nominations, but also inviting nominations based on that pipeline, based on what we had seen come forward before at the agency level. Again, you can do it different ways, but uh, the key thing is to uh, look here at competitiveness. Then the really hard work of, of uh, collaboration on content development begins. And so as we move to the next slide, I'll turn it over to Ann Kellett now. Thank you, Suzanne. I'm Ann Kellett. I have 35 years of experience as a writer and editor at Texas A&M, um, including writing for three presidents and three chancellors of the Texas A&M system. I also have Teaching Research and Service.com, where I work with uh, clients in academia um, all over the world. Um, so now we're moving from the organizational standpoint to the individual nomination. How do you get the best quality nomination possible? Um, so this slide um, is the what. What do you need to do? You need to start with a draft. You need to get it down on paper. You need to have someone else take a look at it to critique it. It's best to do that early on in the process and it's best to get someone who knows something about what you do but who is not a close a colleague in the exact same thing that you do. And then you um, ask that person whether it makes sense, whether there are any gaps in your first draft and you revise as needed. Um, you know, it, it sounds straightforward, like it's common sense and it really is, but writing can be tricky and intimidating. So how do you move from the what to the how you get it all down? Um, and what I would recommend one way is to think in terms of story. Think of a nomination in terms of a story narrative. Why do you do that? Because humans are storytelling creatures. It's part of our genetic makeup. Um, studies have shown repeatedly that what information is told in story form compared to just bullet form or list form or straight narrative, it's retained better by readers and it is more persuasive to readers. Um, so the benefit of story is because it's linear and it also has that emotional or more personal element, that human element that makes your nomination stand out above the others being considered. The question we need to think of always in the back of our minds when we write is, from the reader's perspective, why should I care? Why should the reader turn the page at all? To answer that question and to think in terms of story, it's best to break it down into just manageable chunks. Um, there's a beginning. What is the problem that this nominate, nominee um, intended to solve? There's a middle. What did the nominee do to address the problem? And of course, there's an end. What was the result of the nominee's actions to solve this problem? Um, so, the, um, the nominee, if you think of the nominee as the protagonist or the main character, that makes the whole situation more relatable um, to the reader. And of course, what the nominee did is the plot. But it's helpful to think in terms of plot, not just what happened, but what happened in, to the other people in response to what happened. How did people respond to what happened, not just what happened? Um, so then you take that one person's story, the nominee's story, and then you add a bit of a larger context to show the effect of the story in the larger world. Um, and you tell an emotional component. You tie the facts of what the nominee did to the emotions of how this improved lives of those who were participants. So the bottom line is that facts plus emotion um, together, they answer this, the question of why should I care? Uh, next slide, please. So here's an example from Suzanne. Um, you know, the first step is obvious. How do you start out? You have to write it down. You have to get the whole thing down on paper. Uh, the, the 
novelist Nora Roberts says that you can't edit a blank page, and that's true. So I would recommend for the nominee or the person writing the nomination to just sit down, write from beginning to end, don't pay attention to grammar or fact checking or anything like that at this point. Just get everything down in chronological order. Try not to use jargon. Uh, keep in the back of your mind. If you were sitting next to someone on an airplane and explaining about what this is, what kinds of words would you use that are conversational and um, not filled with jargon? Um, then after the whole thing is written down, go back and try to think in terms of um, show, don't tell. Okay, show what's happening, don't just tell what's happening. You want the reader to experience this. You want the reader to see what's going on through your eyes. Um, and the more the better at this point and for you more, as an editor. That's right, this also stand and helps you stand out from the other nominations. You want to, um, then go back and add any definitions or larger context to make it relatable. So how do you do that? For example, if the program you're talking about has to do with nutrition, you would say not just that the particip participants were overweight, you would say how the participant, how three of the participants could not make it up two flights of stairs without getting out of breath, or how some of the participants had to use extenders on their seat belts in their cars. You want to paint a mental picture, not just the facts of what's going on. And then you want to add, finally, um, specifics, quantifiable, measurable objectives. Next slide, please. So how, if you look at the question, why should the reader care? The next step is to add a larger context. You want the reader to always be in the story. You don't want them to ever say, now, what is that? Or, or what is the context here? What does that mean for your state? How does that compare to national trends? You, you fill in the blanks, you answer the context, you give the larger picture so that the reviewer um, doesn't have to think. It's all right there because the reviewers are reviewing dozens, if not hundreds of other um, nominations and you want them to stay right there with you. So you go from the specific, which is your program, to the more general, which is the context of the problem in the larger world. Next slide, please. And then finally, after you've told your story and the story how it, in how it affects the larger context, you go back and you try to interpret. What does all of it mean? You know, why was this the right program at the right time and in the right place. You are reinforcing the justification for this particular program. What is better as a result of this? What has changed? What is the human impact? Um, for example, if the program was about nutrition or good health, you could talk about how, how one of the participants can now swing her grandchild at the playground, or um, someone has gotten off of their meds for high blood pressure or something like that. You show the facts, the larger context, and then you get back to that emotion. Um, and then if possible, add the ripple effect. How did this program um, have ripples that reach people even beyond the immediate participants. If people are modeling better nutrition and it's improved health in their families and their communities, try to capture that as well. Next slide, please. And then you want to make the, the process of preparing these nominations as efficient as possible, of course. The writing process is tedious. Um, but to do a good job, it really is worthwhile, and there really are no shortcuts. But there are some efficiencies, and um, you can go through, and Suzanne actually came up with these, as well as all of these. You can go through and find the common themes in your program. What are some of the phrases, some of the language that speaks to just about everything you do? And then come up with phrases that you can use and plug in to other nominations. Uh, next slide, please. And here, here are two more examples um, that show exactly what that is. Try to think in terms of how you can not have to reinvent the wheel next time, but come up with a template phrase, template phrases that you can plug in 
elsewhere. Next. They make good transitions there to the facts and the rest of the story. That's right. And finally, you can also be strategic with your testimonials. These are so important. Um, you think, give some thought to who you want to, to write testimonials. Who would be the best at telling the emotional story? Who would be the best at telling the economic impact story or the more nuts and bolts financials, the hard numbers? Um, Suzanne Kate has these examples. You can see in the first one, she's tireless, enthusiastic, always ready to pitch in. No doubt that's true, but it doesn't tell the reader really anything um, of importance. So try to specify what that means, as is done in these um, two later examples. We benefited from scholarships. Um, we, he guided me through this process, and now we're doing so much better in whatever it is. Next slide, please. And a couple more examples. Yeah, just a couple of more examples. You can see again, the first one, she, um, she, in, uh, she includes the, the emotional. It was the, one of the best decisions I made. Terrific, that makes you really stand out. But then she gets back to the specifics, how it affected her health and well-being. And then the second one, you can see, um, it has this, the story structure three years ago, the beginning, what happened. Um, in the middle. And now, today, we have grown to eight from one farmer's markets. And not only that, it has had this ripple effect in the community because there's more demand from restaurants for um, purchasing our, the produce that these eight farmer's markets are now producing. So um, try to think in terms of a story and always answer the question, why should the reader care by adding the facts plus an overlay of an emotional experience. And now Suzanne will conclude with a brief discussion about the payoff of all of this work. Mm -hmm. Well, and we're all so happy when someone uh, successfully uh, has a, a winning nomination. But, uh, you know, and we've had quotes from folks who just said, what an adventure the nomination process turned out to be. It was the highlight of their career. Uh, you know, there are stipends, so, you know, they are, are good testimonies to the, to the effort. But really, the, the, the more comprehensive effect, uh, besides having award-winning nominations, is having, and the next slide, please, um, a payoff that includes a respected awards program, that it is one that is drawn uh, from a number of nominations, from nominations that are representative from across the country. And, uh, you know, that sometimes we hear, you know, that this, uh, in, in some of our agency levels and others, that uh, they're reconsidering having a category for extension. That has happened in Texas. They said, oh, well, if only, you know, the other uh, agency components that organizations had nominations as strong as yours, we wouldn't be reconsidering this. Or they go in and change the criteria. We've had, we've actually lost some awards before in our state. So a respected awards program, uh, respect for extension education, and the fact that you have a documentation that can be used in other ways, richer material to mine uh, for annual reports, uh, for impact reports, success stories, that systems thinking. Sometimes we see those silos and uh, separate efforts to identify some of the same stories when really the awards come from a different motivation from our people. It comes from a different place and I think they're a little more robust and committed to submitting that documentation than they are in their monthly reports and our accountability system. Uh, and I'm glad to see that these uh, Excellence and Extension and the Diversity Awards now require that the recipient also submit an abstract of it, uh, of their nomination for the impact database. Uh, but you could be mining many more, not just the uh, award recipients, uh, for those testimonials that you can use for the legislator, legislature and your budget requests, your grant proposals. Uh, programming oversight at the administrative level. I have seen a lot in these nominations that I know maybe weren't on target with uh, the, the 
programming priorities at the administrative level and what they hope to see. Uh, sometimes a nomination of uh, what is really a hobby effort that doesn't speak to some of the societal issues that we're trying to address. So there's benefit in reviewing these beyond the uh, award selection committee, I think. And then with your marketing and communications group, news stories, uh, features. Uh, so there's a lot of rich material and payoff in the effort to manage your awards to get the higher quality uh, nominations. And finally, how we could improve in the next slide. Um, I think that you can maximize these payoffs by improving internal connections. And in Texas, you know, I happen to be a senior uh, experienced communication specialist, so I knew where to go and who to talk to. This could be institutionalized more as connections or just vested in a, in a particular person. But to draw uh, from employee development, uh, program development and evaluation, of reporting and accountability and marketing and communications uh, to maximize those payoffs and improve the, the connections that you can reap from the awards process. And then enhance the recognition of awards, uh, award recipients, those incentives. Yes, the, the uh, uh, you know, frame worthy certificate is nice to have, but is there other prestige? Possibly appoint these folks to uh, an advisory role or a leadership role in your organization, which also saves you a lot of trouble mm -hmm. of how do you identify and get nominations to serve on a task force or an advisory capacity? Because these are already peer identified people that you could uh, tap. And, um, and then also I think that um, you can, enhance their return on participating in the awards by bringing organizational support to bear, services to bear. Uh, get those program and evaluation folks and make that program even better. It's not a dead end to get an award. That's a program that's worthy of being replicated. Uh, possibly, you know, at the national level, connect with eExtension and the innovation facilitators to target some of these programs outside of an application process, outside of a process, process that requires them more effort to apply for service, possibly tie some of that service to your awards program. So uh, that's a, a, a wrap, I think, on mm -hmm. our perspectives and for her many years of writing and my many years of collaborating on awards, but also working uh, at the organizational perspective of, of strengthening them. So, Turn that back over to you, Ed. Okay, thank you very much, Suzanne, and Anne. Thank you for for a very uh, important and, and good presentation here. Before I open it up for questions, I would like to give a couple of our colleagues an opportunity to make a couple of comments. And and uh, first, uh, Dr. Ligari from Tennessee State, and then uh, Dr. Demona Doy from Oklahoma State. So, Dr. Ligari, if you want to add here, please. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Thank you, team. Um, yeah, we had the winner of the regional 1890 regional winner last year, uh, Dr. Dikoff, uh, in 2018. And a lot of those factors that are shared here uh, were true in that case, uh, because it takes a lot of uh, foundational work to look at some of those characters, the characteristics that were mentioned in the area of programming, in the area of collaboration, uh, sometime across the nation with other colleagues, um, as well as the quality, the depth of the program, and, and then the peer review at the local level. Um, the way we did that, we opened up to all the faculty here, extension faculty mostly here at Tennessee State University, and then several people um, submitted there, and then we had a committee that reviewed it, and then we selected top one that we thought probably uh, will have a good chance. Now, having said that, I also do want to admit, though, there are a lot of points that are mentioned today, uh, particularly from Texas A&M, &M, that, that I think are also new to me. So I learned a lot myself just being um, on the workshop and on this webinar today. 
but the point is going back to this colleague that won the program last year, uh, he had several um, very creative programs, cutting edge programs. For example, he had mobile biodiesel demonstration um, trailer that he come up with the idea that he took around uh, all the way from forage programs to uh, small farmers, minority farmers to large farmers. Anybody wanted to get into that area. Uh, he created the lab or a tool uh, that people can know about their acreage anywhere in Tennessee using that GIS system about the characteristics of their soils. So he did a lot of good uh, in-depth programs. Um, he also collaborated with the uh, national about uh, I think 30 different individuals to have a trials um, of canola seed uh, varieties at different locations across the country. So there was a collaboration nationwide, there was depth in the program, and again that the things that he did here in Tennessee also had a lot of meat in the programming. Uh, it was not just uh, you know, we have all variety of programs that we do in extension, uh, but his programs were very uh, much based on the curriculum. Uh, they had a lot of support material that he provided, uh, and he did that very consistently with the agents training as well as with the farmers. So the quality of his programs, the depth of his program, uh, all of those were outstanding. And I think with that, um, his peers also uh, recognized that that should be the one that should go forward. Um, so those were some of the things, and obviously he was, he's also very active on social media. Mm -hmm. uh, he's not one of those bragging people, but he is one that's available to people all the time. That people, if they need help, uh, farmers, students, um, as well as the, the 4 members and, and colleagues, uh, that he's very willing to serve on different committees, a uh, hardworking person. So I think all those characters really contributed what I thought to a stronger application last year. Thank you, Dr. Jones. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. That's very helpful and uh, I appreciate that. Demona, if you have some comments you'd like to add as well, please? Sure. Uh Thank you, and, and it, like our previous speaker, I've, I've learned some things as well. We're, we're a low input operation here, so I'm envious of our Texas A&M colleagues having these uh, experts to call on to help with the nominations. But just a few practical things. I think it's important to send out the nomination information early. So if yeah. you want uh, the cooperation, collaboration of busy state specialists, busy educators, kind of getting in on their radar early, is important and sending out multiple reminders is useful. We kind of, we've had, as has been suggested, a, a kind of a blanket invitation to apply, but we've also targeted a few individuals that we think are, have the kind of programming and the leadership regionally and nationally have demonstrated teamwork, quality of programming and have done some impact assessment. So we've, we've identified some people that we may want to cultivate for future awards as well. And, and we've just hired uh, our first evaluation specialist this, this late last year. And so we've mentioned to them that we want them to start to help us to identify programs and individuals that may qualify for these kinds of awards. Occasionally we have um, modest specialists and so you kind of have to, to encourage them to apply. So in my departmental role, I had a colleague who had a wonderful teaching program, but really was very reluctant to apply. So I had to kind of sell them on, you know, it's for the good of the institution. And it is because mm -hmm. it enhances your, your regional and national reputation to, to uh, share with others the kinds of, of programs that you have there. Uh, when Ed emailed me, I mentioned, you know, it could be, my comments could be really short in that it's, you gotta have people doing good work and all of us do have those people. And the other thing is in, in putting the package together, my approach has kind of been that it's like a grant proposal. So you look mm -hmm. at the criteria and you very carefully uh, address the points and look at the weights on the different categories and spend your time accordingly there in, in developing the write-up. Because we have had some success, we've also had a number of successful applications and our specialists have been very willing to share those with other, other colleagues. And so, 
I don't know if that's something that we could consider nationally, if people were willing to share their applications, just so people have an example mm -hmm. of, of how, uh, how to write things up. I'd also say that with respect to getting quotes and, and testimonials, I think those are really great um, and accent the applications, if you will. And we don't have to ask people for letters. Uh, and again, in some of my other capacities, you know, if you can just get somebody to send you a great sentence, mm -hmm. that's what you need. Mm -hmm. And if you can identify, again, a, an array, maybe it's just a half a dozen people that can describe different aspects of that person's program and the depth and the, and the breadth, I think that can really uh, strengthen the, the package there. So um, a, a lot of times, like I said, we, th we think we have to ask people for letters and really what we need to a good, uh, good sentence or two. So I think that's, uh, those are a few quick things that I would add. Excellent. Thank you. So we've gotten a wealth of information and we've got some time now that we can open it up for questions. Carolyn has had to leave us. Um, she had another appointment that was um, very important. So um, she won't be with us for that part, but uh, we still have Vonda and uh, Suzanne and Ann and, and Dr. Ligari and Dr. Doy are both with us. So um, we can open the floor for questions. And possibly while some of those are coming in on chat, I would uh, mention that, you know, quotes are great and they don't have to be original quotes for the specific awards program. You can draw the quotes from the nominations that were developed for, for other awards. So it's really good to have access to, you know, within your organization to all the nominations that have been done at all the levels uh, because you can interchange some of the, the content. And then also, you know, with regard to Short staffing, which we understand, um, as I mentioned, some of this has been an evolution and I'm not even sure what's still being done in Texas, but a lot of the work can be done the year after a nomination is first written. Uh, that's when you've bought yourself the time to uh, invest in the critiquing and the editing and the research to do more substantiation uh, and if you will, that first year is sometimes a first draft. So we put a lot of emphasis on resubmitting nominations. Excellent points. And uh, if you have questions, please chime in. Those of you on the phone, you have to hit star six to unmute. Um, we want to make sure everybody has an opportunity. And if we can't get to all of them, you know, let let. Sandy no, and uh, we will make sure an answer is, is provided. So questions out there. Can't believe everybody's, this group's usually got a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. Comments. Dr. Jones, this is Latif again from Tennessee State University. Just want to mention one more thing, even though that was mentioned before, is that it's starting early. Uh, for example, you know, for this next year, I have already started talking to people that they need to be, you know, keeping this on their radar and getting their information ready. And some of the uh, factors that have been used in the past uh, have distributed them to them uh, to be looking at it. So I think it's starting early. Um, it has, at least in my experience, been helpful. Are there other challenges that folks have experienced that um, they would really like to share or comment on? Well, the, the starting early sure helps uh, when you have an accomplished nominee. It's hard to have access to your nominee sometimes, you know, and the nominator really needs that input. It can't be a surprise. It won't be as effective. Mm -hmm. And uh, the sooner you start, the, the more likely you can have that back and forth because the, you know, your, your nominees are busy being out in the field. And uh, so you, you uh, aren't as able to do a strong nomination when, when you don't even have, you know, their time. So we, uh, we try to always to have at least eight weeks ahead, but also to train that whole awards committee to plan their whole year. 
Demona, there was a question on the chat. Um, what have you built in, what procedures have you built into your system that will help to lead to additional awards? Yeah, thanks. So, uh, as I mentioned, so we're going to send out the call for award nominees very early on in the process. We'll do that multiple times. Um, our program evaluation specialist may be on today, at least I'll, or, and I'll share the, the PowerPoints with her because we want her to kind of understand the process and what we're looking for. And again, we had conversations even last year with people that we thought might be good candidates this year. So we had um, an individual that we thought stood out last year. And so we're, again, thinking and encouraging people to take advantage of the expertise of our program evaluation specialists to help strengthen their impact assessment and, and their uh, evaluation stories because we, we know we have lots of people doing good program, but because we haven't had a lot of expertise to support them, in that capacity, we've, we're encouraging them to take advantage of, of that as well. So I think that, and, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll repeatedly ask people to submit nominations. And again, when we look at our applications for our in-state awards, that's helped us to identify prospects uh, for awards as well. Excellent, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? We're, we're coming on to the uh, end of our hour, but if people do have questions, um, please send them to Sandy, and uh, we will uh, make sure that folks um, get, get that response and checking with the, our presenters today. Um, this is being recorded, and it will be uh, put on the ECOP Monday Minute, the link to that, so you can review it, and those who weren't able to be with us today can view it, and you can share with colleagues uh, as you uh, see fit. So um, without anything yeah. other. Um, I, I might just ask if Mark will sure. advance to that last slide uh, so that it'll make the recording on, on folks being able to reach us. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Go ahead and advance there, Mark, so people can see that. Contact information is coming up, so hold on if you want to collect that and you can have direct conversation with Suzanne and Ann. And, uh, but we appreciate everybody's participation today. Those who have been in uh, the cold parts of the country, I hope you have all found an opportunity to stay warm and safe. And I, I hope our many colleagues have as well. So again, thanks to uh, to Mark for getting us started today, and to Vonda and Caroline and Ann and Suzanne and, and Latif and uh, Demona for all sharing uh, with us. We appreciate uh, that very much. And we look forward to having just an overflowing number of nominations uh, for all our national awards. So thank you, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.